Hello folks, I'm back. Um, we are going to do P.7 part 2, where we talk about solving formulas and solving equations with absolute value. Those are two ideas that are not really related. That's one of the things uh, that's weird about section P7 is there's a lot of disconnected ideas. Sorry, it's just how it is. It's how the book is written. Um, but we're not here to rewrite the book. So let's talk about solving formulas. Uh, this is something that you'll do a little bit in math for. Um, but you often need in science class, and you also often need a lot in calculus because, uh, you know, calculus is where sort of physics and mathematics start to meet, and you do find yourself taking formulas and solving them around, I would say, quite a lot. Uh, so it's good to be able to do. A lot of times they're not very tricky, uh, but there are, is one important technique that I want to share with you. Uh, you're not going to see it on this problem. This is just an example. So we might see in a problem like this. Uh, that we want to solve s equals c over 1 minus r for the variable r. So your first move will be to go ahead and rewrite it. Um, now we have three letters here. We want to solve for the uh, letter that's specified. You can solve for any of these letters. Solve for, by the way, means uh, isolate on one side. So I want to isolate r. Now, we have a problem here, which is that r is on the bottom of a fraction. So I think the best way to move this is going to be to clear out all fractions. Remember that this s is really like an s over 1. You have an equation, so you can multiply both sides by anything you want. To clear this out, you should multiply both sides by 1 minus r. The right side will be a little easier because when you multiply this in, 1 minus r will reduce out and you're just left with the variable c. On the other side, we have 1 minus r uh, times s, so that's going to be 1 minus r times s. Now this is still not solved for r, but we've at least cleared out the fractions. Next, let's distribute. So uh, I guess s distributes to both terms. So I get s minus rs equals c. I just need to, I'm continuing with my goal, which is to isolate r. Let's go ahead and subtract s from both sides. And I should get negative rs equals negative, uh, or c minus s. I should try to be consistent about the size of my s letters. Let me make some more space too. There. Um, now I'm still trying to solve for R. So I'm going to, uh, this is multiplied together. So I'm going to divide by big S. Um, let's just stick with it. So those will reduce out, uh, and we get negative R is equal to that. So then R should equal the opposite of that. Now with that in mind, I want to keep going here and simplify this a little more. Because if you're doing this in a, in a science class context, having uh, the variable solve for is great, but what you really want is the other side to be as simple as possible too for when you plug in your, your variables uh, or data. So I would distribute that negative to both terms. What's that going to do? Uh, it will make that into negative C plus S over S or just s minus c over s. And this is okay, but I notice there's two s's here and they don't actually need to be. So do you remember if, if you remember from the last video about fractions, it is legal 100% to split that fraction up into s over s minus c over s. Because you have uh, two terms on top, but just one term on the bottom. So you're basically going to unsubtract those fractions uh, giving them the same denominator, then you should get 1 minus c over s equals to r. That is how I would leave this answer. I think that's a lot nicer, um, probably the nicest form you can get. I'd like to show you an alternative and faster technique for this uh, that is legal in this situation. Now, be careful with this. It's not legal in all situations, but it is legal here. Um, 
And the reason it's legal is because I have a fraction on both sides if you write that s as s over 1. If you write that s as s over 1, then one thing that you can do with equations is take the reciprocal of both sides. So this equation would be completely equivalent to writing 1 over s is equal to 1 minus r over c. Why would I do that? Well, it gets r, my target variable, outside of the bottom of a fraction. So once I've done that, then I can multiply both sides by c, a little easier than multiplying by 1 minus r. c doesn't have to distribute, so you just get c over s is equal to 1 minus r. Then I could subtract c over s from both sides, and I could add r to both sides with the goal of isolating r. I could also uh, multiply by negative 1 or something here. And then you could get r is equal to uh, 1 minus c over s. Same thing. I think a little bit easier, less simplifying in the end. So two ways to approach that. Okay, so uh, that's behind us. And sometimes you'll have to solve formulas with fractions. Now I want to look at a situation where uh, you will encounter a lot. And this is the situation that students always ask me a lot of questions about. So that's why I want to talk about it. I would call this a key technique something that you really, really want to put in your toolbox now, because honestly, you're going to use it all year. I think there's a problem like this, maybe not a formula, but a problem that uses this technique in almost every section of our textbook. Uh, and so here is the, the problem. I'm trying to solve this for R, and in this equation, I notice that there are two copies of the letter R. So someone who is approaching this uh, naively will say, might say, oh, well, why don't I just divide both sides by s, and then I get r is 1 plus qr over s. Yes, you have solved for r, but what you have failed to do is actually isolate the variable r. So if I was trying to plug in some numbers and figure out what r is, I wouldn't be able to do it. This is not solved. So we need a different technique. Just dividing by s won't work. In fact, we don't need to divide uh, by s at this point at all. What we are going to do instead, when you have two variables like this, is you're going to group them and then factor out that variable r. So here's what I mean. Uh, I have 1 on the one on the right side, so I'm going to leave that there. Let's take away qr from both sides. Then I'll get sr minus, I can't seem to write a q, qr equals 1. Not so bad. Now, on the left side, you have a polynomial, right? It's got letters instead of numbers, doesn't matter. We have a polynomial with a common multiple, common factor of r. So you're going to bring that common factor out and write it as r times s minus q. Now, and so uh, the reason you do this is we've gone from having two r's to having one r. And that's what lets us proceed with solving. So now, if I want to finish solving for r, I can just divide by s minus q and get r is equal to 1 over big S minus little q. Problem solved. So if you have two variables, group them and then factor them out. Let's look at another situation. Uh, here, we're solving a formula for the variable r1. Um, this is, I think this exact formula shows up in physics a lot. r usually will stand for like resistors or resistance uh, in an electrical context. You can correct me, of course, if I'm wrong there. Um, we're going to try to solve this for R1. And we uh, now I see a mix of techniques, because we might end up with two copies of a variable. We also have those fractions. First thing I'm going to do is, uh, I was going to say I'm going to rewrite the equation, but I'm just going to cross that out so that we can start fresh. Now, uh, I think I want to eliminate all fractions first. So. We said to eliminate all fractions, you can multiply by the least common multiple of all denominators. Well, what are the denominators? 
R, R1, and R2. Those are variables, they're not numbers, so the least common multiple of all those denominators is R times R1 times R2. See, let's, this seems like it's going to not work, right? This is like, what are you doing, Mr. Eck? But look at this. I'm going to multiply the right side by R times R1 times R2, and I'm going to multiply the... I said right side again, didn't I? Multiply the left and right sides by R times R1 times R2. On the actual left side, distribute all three in, the R's will reduce out, and we should be left with 1 times R1, R2. You don't really need to write the 1. In fact, I'm going to stop writing the 1's. Here we have to distribute to both terms. Distributing this to the first term, the R1's will cancel, and I'll get 1 R times R2. And distributing to the second term, the R2's will cancel, and I will get plus 1 R times R1. At this stage, I've cleared out all the fractions, but I have to remember what my goal is. The goal was to solve for R1. Now let's look at what I have as a result. I have an R1 here, and I have an R1 over there. So I have that situation that I just showed you where I have two copies of the same variable. When I have two copies of the same variable, I want to use the strategy of group them and then factor. So I have R1, R2 on the left. I'm going to take away this R, R1 term. leave the rr2 there. I can now factor out an r1. It doesn't matter that it's on different sides there, and this will become r1 times r2 minus r. We're almost done. I've now gone from having two copies of r1 to a single copy, so all I have to do is divide by this term, and we should get that r1 is equal to r times r2 over R2 minus R. Not so bad. Uh, there's a couple other approaches to this that you can take. First, I'm going to show you the uh, a wrong approach. The wrong approach is to say, hey, didn't in the last video you are um, the last problem, you say you can just flip all the fractions? So couldn't I say, oh, well, 1 over R is flip that to R over 1 equals r1 over 1 plus r2 over 1. And then to solve for r1, I just subtract like that. Doesn't work. Not legal. And the reason it's not legal is that the right side is two separate fractions. So the idea of taking the reciprocal of both sides does not work if you have a two fraction situation. However, what you could do in this problem instead is say you're trying to get into a, two fra a one fraction on each side situation. You could add those fractions, right? This is just an addition problem. So if I were to add those fractions, so I just have 1 over r on the right, uh, left, and not leave it, I would need a denominator of r1, r2, the least common multiple of just those denominators. So I would have to multiply this term by r2 over r2, and this term by r1 over r1. And I'd get r2 plus r1 over r1, r2 is equal to 1 over r. At that point, you could then start to flip the fractions. Um, you could also, at this point, multiply by r1, r2. There's a lot of different ways you could approach to solve it. I think at some point, though, because we now have those two r1s, you're still going to end up in a place where you end up uh, wanting to factor and solve. And so uh, you're going to get to the same place no matter what. But it's just another technique that you could maybe use here uh, so, like I could say, now r is equal to r1, r2 over r2 plus r1. That's okay, but I haven't really done a lot. Now I could have r times r2 plus r1 equals r1, r2. And I guess I'd have r, r2 plus r, r1 equals r1. I know my R's are getting sloppy, R1, R2. Then at that point, I have arrived at a step I was already at, so we already talked about how to solve it. 
Um, but I, I wanted to, to work that out just to show you that there's not necessarily a, a required first step. You just want to keep manipulating these things using valid rules until eventually you can clear out the fractions and then isolate terms so you can factor and divide. Let's talk about absolute value equations. And I will say it's weird that these are in the same video. Um, I just don't really want to go to four videos for this section. Uh, so we're going to do absolute value equations here. It's not really related to what we just did. Um, remember our definition of absolute value, which is that uh, the, the real definition from p.1 says absolute value x is actually a two-parter. It is equal to either x if the inside is positive or its opposite if the inside was negative, right? So the absolute value of negative five is equal to five because five is less than zero. So the opposite of opposite five is five. That's why the absolute value technically of negative five is five. And that's important when you're solving equations. So if you don't know what X is, right? In the example, I knew what, what X was, it was negative five. If I don't know what, what x is, like for example, in this situation, the entire thing inside the absolute value, that's like my quote unquote x, is some expression a plus one is equal to five, I have to account for both situations. So here's how you solve these. You've maybe seen this before. Uh, the way you do it is say, I don't know uh, whether this is positive or negative, so either a plus one without the absolute values, that's a parenthesis, is equal to five, or the opposite of that is true. The opposite of a plus one is equal to five. You've maybe seen this in a different way. You've maybe seen the negative attached to the other side. That's probably the most efficient way to solve it, but technically if you follow the definition, the negative opposite sign is attached to whatever was in the absolute values. It's going to work out the same way. Uh, so once you split this off, we're looking at a two solution situation. They're usually linear once you split them off. In this case, a would be four. In this case, um, I can multiply by negative one. So a plus one would equal negative five and a would equal negative six. Those are my two solutions and you should circle both of them. And let's go ahead and plug them in and check. So is the absolute value of four plus one equal to five? Yes. And is the absolute value of negative six plus one equal to five? Yes, because negative six plus one is equal to that, which is equal to that. So that is why both solutions work. Um, and technically uh, what we're doing is we're splitting them up uh, on one half you're making the thing inside the absolute value, what, what we've called the X, just whatever's inside that value, uh, positive. And the other option is making whatever was inside that value negative. And then solve using all your good algebra tools. Let's do a couple more. Um, so here's another one, negative two X minus one is equal to negative eight. You might think, okay, well, I can have, have this or you know, split into two solutions now. But before you split, you have to, have to isolate the absolute value term. That splitting up only works, right? If you go back and look at the definition of absolute value, wherever that was, that definition only works if that's isolated on one single side. So you gotta isolate that term. Um, you can treat this kind of as if it's just in a box, put that in a box, Isolate it with good algebra, like dividing by negative two. And so we get absolute value X minus one equals four. Let's split it up. So I know either X minus one is equal to four or the opposite of X minus one is equal to four. So X minus one would be negative four. Uh, left side goes x should be 5, right side goes x should be negative 3. Those are my two solutions. I'll leave it to you to plug in and check. By the way, I want to share with you another way of thinking about this absolute value equation once we've arrived at this step.
I think it was back in P.1, we talked about absolute value in another way. We said the absolute value of A minus B can be read as the distance between A and B. So if I have an equation, I need some more room. So if I have the equation, absolute value x minus 1 is equal to 4, one way to interpret that is that it's saying the distance between x and 1 is 4. If you think about that, you can kind of think about it geometrically, like put yourself on a number line. Here's one, there's some x over here and over there somewhere. But what I know is that the distance between x and one is four. It could be the distance to the left or it could be the distance to the right. What's four units to the right of one? Five. What's four units to the left of one? Negative three. Those were the two answers. That's another way to think about these. I actually really like that. I, I didn't uh, start my life thinking about them that way. Um, but now that I know that, I, I really do use that kind of a lot. Uh, something that, that just shows up. So there's my gift to you is another way to think about absolute value equations. Let's do one more. So uh, I have three absolute x plus four uh, plus 10 is equal to negative eight. Okay, your first move is to isolate the absolute value term. Now it's kind of like a linear equation, right? It's kind of like three, I'm gonna say a plus 10 equals negative eight. Just do all the good algebra. Let's take away 10 first. So three equals negative 18. So absolute of x plus four should equal negative six. And now you might say, okay, let me go split this up. But wait, if you do, you might get some answers and you might plug them in, but they would be wrong. And here's why. The absolute value of a or whatever a is, is always going to be greater than zero. I'm saying to you, find me an x that makes an absolute value negative. Can't happen. So if you get to this stage, I would say in a problem, stop right there and say uh, absolute value can't uh, be negative six, so no real solutions. Done. Uh, and that's just something to watch out for. Does it happen a lot? No, but it does happen sometimes. Uh, things to watch out for. Thanks all for sticking around. Uh, we're going to do one more video from this section, and that next one's going to be a big one. We're going to talk about quadratics, so I'll see you in that video in just a little bit.